Good morning, everybody. I hope you're going to enjoy this day. I know I am because I've been rehearsing with my singers, and uh, that will be the main uh, meat of what happens. I'll just run through what's going to happen. This first hour, I'm going to sit at the piano and talk about a number of issues that come up from Sullivan's songs, and I shall talk about probably 17 songs. And I shall try and make some general points without actually belaboring them. And so if a point that I've already covered crops up in a song and I don't mention it, that will be for speed. Then at about quarter past 11, we'll have a break and a, a chat. And then at about 11.30, I shall talk about the songs to poems by Adelaide Proctor, a name which Sullivan never learned to spell. <laughs> Although he wrote some splendid songs by her. And that section will culminate in a sort of exegesis of the lost chord, which I regard as Sullivan's great masterpiece, and you'll see why. Then <clears throat> at noon, Amanda Pitt will have joined us shortly before that. We'll probably have a little break before she sings so that we can get used to the piano and the situation. And she will sing, as well as some Sullivan songs, songs by Huller from his Dickens opera, which have not been heard in London since the 1930s. More of them anon. Then we shall break quite a bit before one o'clock for lunch, and it'll be a longish lunch break, so that those of you who want to can leg it along to the Barbican Library and look at the Worship for Company of Musicians exhibition, which is full of wonderful things, and not the least wonderful is the manuscript of The Lost Chord, which belongs to the Worshipful Company, and it's there on display. So if my talking about it has whetted your appetite, you'll know where to slake your thirst. What a terrible, terrible mixed metaphor. And then, at two o'clock, we shall be joined by eight young singers and players, and we shall do a certain amount of work on songs, but uh, it, it will be, I should explain, a very public sort of work. It's more of a display. I shall not be nitpicking and fault-finding with these young singers, uh, whom, in fact, I've very much enjoyed working with, and we will work together to make a presentation of a lot more songs, and then we'll finish with a much less interrupting hour of songs. You will be required to sing on three occasions, and you'll see that on the second page of your handout is the chorus to King Henry's so song. On the third page of your handout is the chorus of John Huller's The Cares of the Day, which is in the noontime concert, and underneath the chorus to The Absent-Minded Beggar, which will require a little bit of explaining when we get there. Good. So I'm going to leap in with an absolutely typical Sullivan song. We will find during the course of the day that Sullivan's songs are very varied. But I'm going to begin with The Sailor's Grave. And The Sailor's Grave, composed in 1872, uh, is a poem written by H.F. Light, who wrote Abide With Me and Praise My Soul, The King of Heaven. And the introduction, I'll just play the introduction. And the things that I'd like you to notice in particular about that introduction are the fact that it begins with a wide rising interval, in this case an octave. And then the, the music falls away. Almost, which is almost, which is Brahms. And we find habits of thought from the great German masters of the whole of the 19th century throughout Sullivan, but with a peculiarly Sullivanesque accent, which we will 
talk about more. Now, uh, once we've had that, the voice comes in. I'm sorry I'm going to sing to you, but we will have really good singers later on. And the voice sings, There is in the wide lone sea a spot unmarked but holy. And we hear how Sullivan is beginning with repeated notes, which we will become familiar with for a particular reason, and then he uses a wide vocal in interval, the interval of the sixth. Ta -da -da -dee -dee -dee. And this reminds us, a thing that we need to bear in mind whenever we're talking about Sullivan songs, that Sullivan was a great singer. Peter Jocelyn has uh, brought some very nice first editions of Sullivan songs today, which he might be persuaded to show you, for, a, for a, doubtless for a compensation. Anyway, uh, which he might be persuaded to show you. And amongst them, um, a copy of the print of Sullivan's first song. Very, very interesting to see. Um, and to my shame, I hadn't seen it before, but uh, I notice that it has in it Ta -da -da -dee -dee already. And Sullivan wrote this song probably for himself to sing as a treble. And you can see the great singer putting this idea into his mind because of its vocal felicity. The end of each verse has a, a very typical Sullivan shape. Uh, where shall I go from? He sleeps a calm and pleasant sleep With the salt waves washing o'er him That's to say, ta da 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 Up to the tomic, the keynote, and then falling down a seventh. We'll hear that a lot as well. And again, it's a, a phrase which is vocal in origin. Now notice that um, we think at this point that we've had a tune. But after two verses of that, Sullivan appears to show us a better tune. So we get to the end of a... And then this happens. Sleep on, thou mighty dead. A glorious tomb they found thee. The broad blue sky above thee spread. And so on. Now, at first, it feels like a new sweep of melody. A better tune, as it were, than the opening tune. But before very long, we realize that Sullivan is doing a trick here that Brahms is very good at. Um, that's to say, he's presenting us with a texture in the... And... It's not so very different from what Brahms is doing in a thing like... we tend to think of as a tune, but which in fact, when we analyze it, is a series of gestures and textures. And that's what Sullivan does in this central section. There's a very interesting discrepancy between the original editions in F and in E-flat in this central section. And Amanda and I, when we were practicing it, had an amusing exchange over it, because when we got to a bit when I was uh, playing... Um, Gallant fleet shall proudly steer. And Amanda sang, Gallant fleet shall proudly steer. And I said, Oh, what's the tuning on the word fleets? And she was able to put me in my place properly by pointing out that the da 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 is actually written, a discordant melody note, but only in the E flat version. And we shall come across several cases today where the, even the original editions are different from each other. And then it's quite important to work out which was the original key in which Sullivan composed his song and from which it was subsequently transposed. And it's not always possible to tell that. The Lost Chord, thanks to the manuscript in the Barbican Library, we know that was in F. So, um, I'm drawing your attention to Da, da, rum, ba, da, 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 because it is a key 
to a very important aspect of Sullivan's writing, as is this nice, what we call secondary seventh underneath. The harmony here is... Bum, ba, bum, ba. It's not... Sullivan is very keen on cramming as many notes into his chords as he can without ever being discordant. He's not very keen on semitones, but he's very keen on that sort of soft sound. And that's another thing which we shall hear again and again today. And one of the reasons, of course, that he was so popular. If you compare Sullivan's harmonic language with the harmonic language of his teacher, Stendhal Bennett, you'll find that Stendhal Bennett is nothing like so sensuous as... as, as And that sort of ear for beauty comes again and again through Sullivan's work. Uh, the, uh, this little quasi-tune ends with a wonderful vocal gesture, which I will attempt to inflict upon you. Um, it's, uh, and what you shout above thee. And the piano echoes it and takes it somewhere else. We are well on the way to getting back to where we first thought of. There's some marvellous chords coming up, but I shall wait until Amanda and I perform them together properly. Uh, but the really extraordinary thing is that suddenly we get a real tune, and it's a tune where the voice leaps up a fourth to the keynote and then falls down again. So, actually, I will play this bit. The voice is singing on a monotone and tombs are asunder and we get this the morning sun from the wave thou'lt bound now lots of Sullivan fingerprints there one of them very important is that Sullivan knows when to interrupt a cadence so what we don't get is It sounds like Elgar, doesn't it, when you do that? Whereas what Sullivan does is... And then the bass, having made its presence felt by playing an unexpected note and interrupting the cadence, does a thing which Sullivan's bass is particularly love to do. It marches down the scale. Now, this real tune that has finally arrived with us is nothing other than the introduction. Now, it might just be that I've looked harder at Sullivan's songs than anybody else's songs, but I don't know anybody else who does that. And as we shall see, Sullivan does it more than once. And it seems such a good trick. You bury something in the introduction, and it's just a little, nothing much. And it turns out to be the major jewel of the song. Now, there's one other thing that I need to draw your attention to. You remember I said this very typical Sullivan shape. La da 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 dee. And at the very end, that comes back. Morning sun from the wave thou'rt bound to rise. And we carry on going up. Now, Sullivan doesn't always do that. It's a very effective thing to do, but it, it's derived from this very common ta -da 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 sort of courteous gesture, becomes brazen. Ta -da 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 -dee -dee. And interestingly enough, the reason that he does it here is because there is a bizarre image in Mr. Light's poem. Um, the sailor has been buried at sea, of course, and at the day of resurrection, from the wave he'll bound. And there's this awful vision of, of the, the shrouded corpse sort of shooting out of the sea and up like the rising sun. And I think actually that's why 
Sullivan has done this rather unusual device at the end. So what I hope that we've gathered from looking at this very typical and splendid Sullivan song is that Sullivan is playing with our expectations of melody. If you read Newman Flower and Herbert Sullivan's book, you'll find that they seem to regard Sullivan's compositional process as being purely concerned with melody. And of course, Sullivan was particularly good at tunes. But there's a lot more to composing music than thinking of a good tune. And the fascinating thing about Sullivan's songs is that we see him toying with what a tune might be and what it might turn into instead. So for that reason, I'm going to uh, move on to the 1866 Shakespeare song, Orpheus with his lute. And this it doesn't have a tune. We sort of think it has a tune, but it has, well, it has a gesture. And here it comes again. And finally, the voice comes in. Now, you'll be pleased to know the voice never has to sing that gesture. But what it has is the absolute opposite to that gesture. It has a long note that does nothing. Orpheus with his lute, and so on. And this might be the moment, as a matter of fact, just to, uh, because I don't want to talk about it when we're actually singers working together. How do you pronounce lute? And I say lute. And Elizabeth Kenny, my colleague at Southampton, who is one of the world's great lutenists, says lute. Um, Dame Felicity Lott, however, when singing this song, is careful to sing lute. Um, and it, it, I mention this because we have to be very, very careful. Uh, uh, there is a case to be made, I suppose, for singing words as Sullivan would have sung them, but we don't really know. Um, and there's a much better case to be made for singing our Sullivan songs so that people listening to them now are not put off by an artificial barrier of, gosh, that sounds a bit odd. And so whether it's lute, I, I think we'll find that Laura Crowther, who's going to sing this this afternoon, is, is a, a lute player. Um, it, it becomes complicated when you have words like suit. I narrow the vowel in suit a little bit. Not that I ever wear one, but... Um, <laughs> And I wouldn't want to say suit. And the other one is um, the, 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 the one that's very crucial at the moment and which I spend a lot of time nagging my younger uh, pupils about is the word to or book or good, um, all of which are very, very narrow. And I was recently recording Jane Austen's nursery rhymes with a junior choir and I got them to sing to in the way that I wanted them to sing to by saying pretend that it's spelt T-W-O. And actually, the number two is pronounced by the young two. But the word two is pronounced by them as two. And the only reason that that's a problem is, first of all, of course, it annoys me because I'm old and grumpy. But secondly, it um, cuts off the best part of the resonance of their voice. And so there's a, a, a school of thought that would say, lute is a much better sing thing to sing than lute which immediately goes forward and gets a little bit narrow. I just thought I'd mention that so that we didn't have a lot of people saying, well, why didn't they aspirate the W's? You'll find that some of our singers, David aspirates his W's, for example, but subtly, very subtly. Um, some of our singers, you'll find, I mean, fight and weather, that sort of thing. Uh, some of our singers aspirate W's more, and uh, quite a few of them aspirate their W's very little. Uh, the word white, for example, is quite likely to come out as white. And uh, that's, that's fine by me. Now, we have this little sort of tune. <clears throat> with his lute, with his lute made trees, and so on. And almost immediately, Sullivan does all that again to the words, well, the, the mountain tops that freeze, just the same, exactly the same. But listen to the harmony this time. Orpheus with his lute, with his lute made trees and the mountain tops that freeze. So he can give us a nice surprise with a weird chord on freeze, but it's the better surprise because he's harmonized exactly with an A flat. 
which is a very, very subtle thing to do. Now, there's just a couple of points uh, that I want to pick on here. There's a lovely progression here. I regard this as a Schubertian progression, and I will be saying a little bit more about Schubert's particular way of progressing when we get to Adelaide Proctor. For the moment, bear with me. This is the sort of thing that Schubert did. To his music, plants and flowers ever sprung. And we started off in B flat, and we've got to G flat, which is a major third away. Very Schubertish. Um, now, when that passage comes again in the second section of the song, we have exactly the same thing. And in this original edition, the music is different. We get, um, I'll, I'll just play what we've had before. To his music, plants and flowers ever sprung. You hear the bass change. At the repeat, we get, in sweet music is such art. That's to say that the D-flat in the bass is delayed by a bar. The, um, the, 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 the grammar, the syntax, is, is, is different. To his music... Plants and flowers ever sung. But in sweet music is such art. So there is a reason in the words for having that note differently. It's very often corrected. And of course, without seeing the manuscript, we can't be exactly sure whether Sullivan really wrote that. But it's rather a nice change. And just in passing, I might say that Sullivan very rarely writes the same thing twice. Some later editions of his uh, songs try to put two verses into a, a repeat system. And the, the, the most telling disaster that we came across, David and I were looking at uh, a Paxman uh, edition of O oh Mistress Mine, which had forced Sullivan's two verses into a structure that could be repeated, and thereby they'd omitted, I think, three bars altogether completely, They'd got a modulation wrong, and they'd missed out one or two other things that we see. So the fact that Sullivan does things differently makes me also think that that's um, uh, probably deliberate. Uh, one other point coming out of this song, and it's to do with Sullivan's harmonic procedures, which are not those of Bach. Um, Sullivan knew all about the harmonic procedures of Bach, but he likes floaty harmonies. And there's a particularly fine moment of floaty harmonies when the, uh, the billows of the sea hung their heads and then lay by, which is a wonderful picture, isn't it? But it goes as follows. Even the billows of the sea hung their heads and then lay by, hung their heads and then lay by. Now, this chord... Is really weird. It's normally corrected to, which is a sort of Bach-like progression. And I don't think Sullivan wanted that. Um, we've already seen how Sullivan's quite happy to have a discordant melody note. There's one in here, actually, uh, which I'll come to. I'll, I'll stick to one point at a time, sorry. Right, so, so we have... Hang there... That wouldn't have bothered Sullivan. We've seen him do that already. And this wonderful... That's a chord that isn't going anywhere. Whereas... That's a chord that's got a, you know, a suit on. It's, uh, it, it knows what it's doing. And I think that this um, hanging harmony is very typical of Sullivan, who's a great sensualist, as we happen to know from other details of his biography. Um, I'll find the very unusual note. Yes, here's the unusual discordant one. To his music, plants and flowers ever sprung as sun and showers the sun and showers. And I think he meant it because it's not so very dissimilar from what we saw him do in The Sailor's Grave. A song that I didn't know at all until I started to do this work for this day is Sweet Day, So Cool. And this is a very early song, 1864, within his first 
three or four songs. And it's got a magic opening. It's not what you do after that. And the voice does uh, the same sort of thing, actually, that we've heard happen in uh, Orpheus with his lute. That's to say, the voice doesn't have a tune. It goes, Sweet day, so cool, so calm, so bright, the bright. Here, of course, a, a high note falling away. And this whole thing is just very grateful to sing. It's beautiful, beautiful vocal writing. Now, that section at which I stopped for the moment has a very important aspect of Sullivan's art in it. Um, I'm going to try not to get bogged down today, as I succeeded in doing at Sirencester last week, in questions of keyboard temperament. Suffice it to say that this piano, like all modern pianos, is tuned in what we call equal temperament, and it means that all the intervals are wrong. But they're equally wrong. So it's good democratic stuff, and it's perhaps significant that we should be becoming interested in undemocratic temperaments in the 21st century. I don't know if that's worrying. But, um, so, we needn't worry too much about temperaments. I, I will drop ideas about temperament from time to time, but the, the technique of Sullivan's that I want to draw attention to doesn't depend on temperament. Only the voice has the D-sharp. The bridal of the earth and sky. The piano is not playing the D-sharp, and so they gave me the opportunity to sing the D-sharp a little bit flat. I did that on purpose. And the reason that I sang flat on purpose is because this, if you listen to these chords. We're so used to that dominant seventh as being a that, that we feel that we've halfway finished the phrase. And it's very important that we don't feel that. And it can be made possible by the fact that the singer alone has the D sharp, and then what happens beautifully in the next bar can work. The bridal of the earth and sky. And that wonderful Wagnerian chord coming in there works much better if the phrase has not interrupted itself beforehand. Now, I could spend far too long on the merits of this very, very wonderful song, but I will limit myself to one more comment. Uh, the bass, this... keeps going all the way through, rather like a passacaglia, and the accompaniment gets busier and busier. And then... So it builds up towards the end. And eventually, we get this. Flowers decay and seasons roll. It cannot die. Well, you won't find that in Schubert. And that is a very peculiar, what I call a mixolydian chord. I call it a mixolydian chord because the mixolydian mode, which is like the white notes on G, has a flat leading note, and so that very extraordinary D natural. It cannot die, it cannot die, and so on, is peculiar to Sullivan, and as we shall see, Huller. But more of that anon. The Willow song, um, I've just got a couple of things. I've got time to say a couple of things about the Willow song, I think. Uh, it comes from that same early set of Shakespeare songs, and it begins with this marvellous sort of surreal harp chords that, um, that don't resolve. Very like, here they are writ large.
so on. Now, I think we'll talk a little bit more about this this afternoon, about the quality of the melody that's coming up in this song when Belinda is here to sing it. But the, the fascinating thing is that it turns out not to be a tune. And as I pointed out last weekend, if Sullivan wanted to write a tune about a willow, he wrote... No, he didn't. Now, in fact, the two songs in shape are not so very different. This one goes, oh, sorry. And then there's a sort of titwillow, titwillow, which goes, sing all agree. And so those two songs, the one from the Mikado and this one from the Shakespeare songs, give us a very good controlling experiment, as it were, as to what's the difference between a, a tune and a song. And the Willow song, when Belinda sings it this afternoon, we will find has wonderful uh, non-melodic qualities. Just one of which I'm going to mention now, because it's on the same topic as, um, as I mentioned in Sweet Day. It's when the voice alone has one of the important notes and so can bend the pitch. And so the lyrical section that comes in, the fresh streams ran by her and murmured her moans. That note, which again, you see, I'm, I'm singing it flatter than the piano would make me. The fresh streams ran by her and... Now, that E flat that I'm playing there on the piano in equal temperament, I would actually prefer that to be a little bit sharper. Um, but there's nothing I can do about it because the piano is beautifully in tune in equal temperament. But it's possible, it's possible. This is not a criticism of this wonderful instrument. That's honest, honest, it's not. Um, uh, I, I, I th think that I detect uh, in Sullivan's songs up to about 1870 the possibility that he's thinking not in the modern equal temperament, through little details like that. If I play this uh, progression just very bluntly on the piano. It doesn't sound to my ear as beautiful as it sounds when I play it on my 1828 Broadwood, which is not tuned in equal temperament. Unfortunately, I don't think I've brought it today. Um, but the singer can at least get us halfway towards the delicate things. Uh, and just in passing, just to remind those of you who heard me wittering on about this last, uh, last week, uh, when we talk about questions of keyboard temperament in Sullivan, it becomes very important because organs were not tuned in equal temperament until the 20th century. So Sullivan would always have expected his organs to sound a bit odd. And so that tells us, it would be very interesting to know, for example, whether his hymn tunes were written in A-flat or G originally, or maybe A, because those three keys will sound very different. Um, I'm going to save O oh, Mistress Mine up. Um, I've mentioned it already, and we will have fun with it later on. Um, so I'm going to turn to the first of several songs by Lionel Lewin. And Lionel... H. Lewin, once misprinted as Lionel N. Lewin, giving one particular American library the chance to say that only Lionel N. Lewin is correct, because that was the one that he'd owned. Um, it, it, it's worth looking to see what you can find scanned on the web, by the way. I've, um, I've spent goodness knows how much in the British Library getting photocopies of uh, original editions for this, but you can find some quite good scans uh, online. If you Google Lewin, for example, or Proctor, you'll find that their aficionados have scanned all the relevant songs onto the web. Um, you then, however, have to come to terms with the fact that they're all in American editions, and you need to ask yourself whether those American editions are correct compared to the Boozy and Hawks editions that they were originally published in. Lionel Lewin um, it's very difficult to find out very much information about him, but one deeply regrets the fact that he died when he was about 26 because he was going to write the libretto for Sullivan's great Arthurian opera. And we shall hear today the song Guinevere, 
which will make us think that maybe Lionel Lewin and Sullivan would have made a terrific Arthurian opera together. I've come to admire Lewin a lot, but I have no idea when he was born, and I can only tell you that he died in 1874, shortly after Sullivan had put him in the preface and thanked him in his hymn book, which is dated Easter 1874. So presumably Lionel Lewin died at the age of about 26 in the second part of 1874. Now, here's once again, and the phrase that falls from the tonic here becomes the hook of the song. If I skim through the first bit, it goes, I linger on the very spot, it's about double speed, where years ago we met and wonder when you quite forgot or if you quite forget and tender yearnings rise and renew for love that used to be if you could know that I was true and I that you were free and now Again. And I'm not going to spoil it anymore because Frederick will sing it very beautifully this afternoon. But this love once again, it's sort of the opposite to that uh, song. There's a song which goes, is it a dream? That's it, isn't it? And it's, it's the sort of, it's, it's the is this a dream hook, but the other way around. And this one has that beautiful falling vocal idea, love once again. And Frederick and I will be playing around with that this afternoon for a particular reason. This edition in D minor, an American edition, is one of those that tries to sandwich two verses into a repeat scheme. That's to say they only write the music out once. But if you look at this version uh, in a higher key, you'll discover that there is one difference between the two verses. Can I not be heard? Can, can, can we turn me up, please, Scott? Thank you. There's one difference between the two verses, and that is that in the second verse, the crescendo hairpin, as we call it, there's a hairpin in the ah, love one. And in each verse, there's a hairpin upwards, which means get, loud, get louder. In the second verse, that hairpin is preceded by the word crescendo, which means the same thing, doesn't it? So why did they go to all the trouble to write the music out twice, purely to have the one difference between the two verses being the word crescendo added at a place that it seems to be redundant? And this is much too big. I've made a little stern note to myself in my notes. I've put, don't get sidetracked. So I'm just about to get sidetracked. Um, in my work on Mendelssohn, I've been doing a great deal of work on Mendelssohn, and incidentally, on the teacher-pupil chain, Mendelssohn, Sterndale Bennett, Arthur Sullivan, which I regard as being extremely significant, and I shall refer to it bit by bit during the day. But in my work on Mendelssohn, I've discovered a couple of things, and the one that I'll mention at the moment is that Mendelssohn very frequently uses the word crescendo and diminuendo and hairpins, up or down, in apparently contradictory or superfluous ways. And the conclusion that I've come to that's in Mendelssohn's mind, and as it turns out in Sullivan's mind, and Sterndale Bennett's mind, is what I can only describe as a sort of psychological notation, that if you're feeling impetuous and advancing, and you want things to get louder, you'll dash down a, a hairpin. But if you're feeling ponderous and thoughtful as you get louder, you will write the word crescendo. And this, I think, is perfectly unconscious in Sullivan and perfectly unconscious in Mendelssohn until the fifth book of the Songs Without Words, by which time he'd realized what he was doing. And this is the bit that I'm not going to get sidetracked on, because today is not about Mendelssohn. But, my working hypothesis is that if I see a composer who has an interesting mixed use of hairpins 
and the written word crescendo or diminuendo, is that I tend to think backwards in terms of tempo for the written word and forwards in terms of tempo for the hairpin. And that, I think, is the reason for the difference between the two verses. And Freddie and I will discuss that a little bit more this afternoon. Now, here's Guinevere, and I was going to, I, I will make time for myself just to discuss the introduction of Guinevere. Now, Sullivan has done an extraordinarily clever thing there. He's mixed two possible musical opening shapes. One he's borrowed, uh, at its most famous place, I suppose, is uh, the Fingal's Cave Overture. And so on, that's how you hear it twice. So you've got... So from one point of view, we begin by thinking, ah, oh, he's presenting pairs of things. Lots of composers work in pairs. Um, but the other very common opening is what you get in... or... And these are very, very simple examples I, I wrote down. Well, I wouldn't even have too many, but it's one thing similar thing, thing twice as long. Or one thing, similar thing, thing twice as long. And you find that um, again and again. Um, either as, it, It's a little bit like a musical fractal, if you like. The Germans have a word for it. It's called bar form. It means two bits and a long bit. Um, and you can see it replicated. Some of Wagner's operas are five-hour bar forms. Now, what Sullivan has done here is that at the same time that he appears to be giving us matched pairs of things, he's actually writing a bar form because we've got one thing, similar thing, thing twice as long. So that's actually an immensely subtle way of introducing what is in fact an enormous song and I wanted to point it out because I think it's perfectly conscious composing I think Sullivan was being careful to set himself out in a grand scale the other interesting thing about this song apart from its look here's here's a passage cloudless love heard that before I dare say and there's a marvelous bit in the middle where you reharmonize this we're familiar with that in all directions. Um, but we're not familiar with, um, there it is, it's at this pitch. So we've got the la di 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 except this time it's, there was snow in the moonlight gleam. So he completely reharmonizes it, but it's the same falling shape. So it keeps its vocal beauty, but it changes its meaning. Now I just stumbled across, thanks to Christopher Irvin Brown, the first original Lionel Lewin song, A Life That Lives For You. And Harry Bennett, one of our singers, has very kindly cobbled this together in a week so that we can hear it this afternoon. It's a very interesting song indeed. It starts off and you think, ah, this is going to be one of those songs that's a tune. It goes. Fantastic. It's good, isn't it? I mean, who else could have written that? John Huller, as we shall see. But, um, 
but it's very, very characteristic. Now, the uh, verse structure is quite interesting. It runs as follows. The sweet seductive arts that conquer maidens' hearts I never knew. The, tenderest, piteous, the tender piteous sighs and looks from longing eyes, soft looks that ladies prize when lovers woo. My winning word and wooing glance are shivered sword and shattered lance and honours wrung from battle's chance, but all for love of you. What need to call you fair and praise your beauty rare as all men do? Tis not the silver tongue, soft speech and softer song that proves the love is strong, the heart is true, and here the meter changes. Nay, turn and give that palm to one who yields before your charm. A loving heart, a lusty arm, a life that lives for you. So it's, uh, it's a, a, a battle-scarred warrior trying to convince himself that he doesn't need the softer virtues in order to attract his ladies. And Sullivan does a very interesting thing with that change of meter. But there are a couple of things I want to point out before we get there, and that's his use of the mark Sforzato, SF. A, a, another brief reference to Mendelssohn. If you look at Mendelssohn's Songs Without Words in particular, you'll find that there are, on average, I think, seven sforzatos per page. And the usual means of interpreting the mark sforzato on the piano is bang it a bit. That's what we tend to think it means. That's what it tells us it means in the books. But avoiding the explanation, which will keep us here all day, uh, my contention is that these sforzatos in Mendelssohn are accents of a different nature. They are rhetorical accents. They are accents of delay or of prolongation. So that instead of going, tum, 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 da, like that, you might go, tum, 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 ta, da, di, di, di. Or you might go, tum, 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 ta, di, 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 di. All of which are much more subtle and Mendelssohnian than just banging it a bit. And in this particular song, Sullivan shows himself a master of this interpretation of Sforzato because he has a wonderful way of tucking that meter into um, the sort of lyrical melody that he wants to write. And it's this. The sweet seductive arts that conquer maidens' hearts I never knew. And so on. And the way that he does that hearts is that he puts a sforzato on it. Now, if I were to interpret the sforzato in the normal manner, the sweet seductive arts that conquer maidens' hearts I never knew. And I don't think that's what he means. And in particular, there's a very interesting comparison between the introduction and the interlude. Um, I will call out the dynamic marks. Um, forte! 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 And in the interlude, the dynamic marks are... Sforzato, sforzato, nothing at all. But the overall dynamic is fortissimo. And so it would be mad to be playing fortissimo. And it can only really refer, therefore, to delay. And I'm very pleased to find that my months and months of work with Sullivan are reinforcing my years and years of work with Mendelssohn. So very good, thank you, Sullivan. So one would, one would do this. And of course, you mustn't have a sorts out the last one, a sorts out because you, you want to get on. And so it's very important to continue. Right, what does Sullivan do where the meter changes? He writes a tune. So you get, Tis not the silver tongue that proves the love is true. Nay, turn and give that palm to one who yields before your charm. A loving heart, a lusty arm, a life that... And so on. Now... This is rather a good. Very char 
militaristic phrase, is it not? Have any of you heard it before? Some of you will know this song, of course. Have you heard it in a different song, I wonder? Because in 1887, a fellow called Elgar wrote a marvellous Sullivan-like ballad called As I Lay A-Thinking. And it's very difficult to get. It's kind of gold dust in originals. I haven't got an original with me, unlike Peter. Peter's a man for your originals. Um, but I have got a photocopy of it, and those of you who are acquainted with the title pages of Sullivan songs will see that this is just simply a clone of it. And it's a marvellous ballad. It's six and a half minutes long. And t towards the end, it does this. Dies while soaring to the skies. Midst the stars she seemed to rise. Absolutely, exactly the same progression, and I feel that um, it's it's borrowed. And why not borrowed? I mean, I don't mean it's stolen, but. Um, I think Elgar must have known and admired Sullivan's style. Now, I've got what is actually one of my favourite of all Sullivan's songs, Birds in the Night, that I want to talk a little bit about now. And this reminds us that in his comical work, as in his serious work, Sullivan always remains a great composer. Because Birds in the Night is a rewrite of the lullaby from Cox and Box. And the original words are hush a -by bacon on the stove top. And improbably, Sullivan has written a great piece of music for this little spoof. And Lionel Lewin was the man whom Sullivan chose to rescue his great composition from its mere amusing quality. In fact, uh, Bernand, who wrote Cox and Box, Cox and Box uh, wrote to complain about the new words, and Sullivan said, well, I told you about this. And then, in this letter, he says, moreover, the new words are excellent, done in my own house, and every line considered with regard to the requirements of the music. Now, that becomes important, I must say. Um, the song, for those of you who don't know it, has a lovely introduction. And Sullivan does musically a very clever thing here. He turns that opening of his verse melody into the chorus. So that you get la 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 so on. And it's the same tune, but as you'll hear, it's got a slightly sinister. And I wouldn't have registered that as being particularly sinister, but Belinda, uh, it's, it's always wonderful working with singers because singers put themselves inside the words um, much better than I ever can. And uh, we'll probably get Belinda to explain why she put the idea in my mind that that's a, a significant bit of composing, but I'm sure it is. Now, um, in the Cox and Box version, it's uh, all got onto two sheets of paper because they've done this wretched repeat business. But in the subtle version, it's all written out, and it's written out for reasons connected with those hairpins and crescendo marks. So, for example, in the first verse, the link into the chorus just says row. There's nothing else. La 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 bye. But in the second verse, that same passage says row, but the three chords have got a hairpin up 
followed immediately by a hairpin down, which is a special case. That's almost a third sign. We won't go into that because, but it, certainly it's a difference. And how I choose to interpret the difference probably will be la 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 So that I will have a, a feeling of, of that. It has to be a feeling, of course, because at the piano I can't make the notes any louder once I've played them. But that's one of the things that's different. The other thing that's very interesting, if you compare it, some of you will know the... Um, modern typeset versions of these songs that you can get off the Boise State University site. Please don't use them. I haven't found one yet that hasn't had a mistake in it. Um, and very often the mistakes are terribly, terribly significant. Sometimes they're just notes. I mean, we can e even, even the original editions have notes wrong. There's a wrong note in the original edition of, um, of Birds in the Night, I am convinced. Uh, I won't bother you with what it is, but it's, it's pretty obviously a wrong note. Um, but what this edition does is that it decides that if there's a hairpin in the piano part, there should be a hairpin in the voice part too, and vice versa. Well, actually not, because what's really lovely is things like, oh, well, here's the best one. Lullaby, baby, while the hours run. But you don't want a hairpin in the voice there. The voice is dying away. But you need that shape in the piano. And then you get one in the voice, but not in the piano in the next one. Fair may the day be when night is done. And you're going to an unexpected high note, and therefore the hairpin in the voice part uh, makes a point of that. Now... In the first verse, the piano in that bar doesn't have anything, but in this second verse, it has a most interesting mark, which is a real performance trick. And that was why I was so pleased to find Sullivan saying, done in my own house and every line considered with regard to the requirements of the music, which means that Sullivan, with Lewin with him, must have gone through this piece so carefully. And so he really meant this sign. And at first, it appears to mean nothing. It is this. I'll just play the accompaniment and I'll tell you the signs. When night is done, now there's a hairpin. Accent. How bizarre. Followed by a piano mark. But in performance, in conjunction with the mark in the voice part, we get this. Lullaby, baby, while the hours run. Fair may the day be when night is done. Of course, I can't sing, but you wait till Belinda does this afternoon. And it's a performing gesture um, written in only the second verse by clearly a great performer, which is what Sullivan was. Um, Enough of Lewin, I think, for the moment. I thought it would be useful to um, have a look at a couple of tunes, because we are going to have straightforward tunes this afternoon, as well as these more complicated songs. And the first one I've got is, is from the much maligned Kenilworth. I've got a very soft spot for Henry, whatever his name Father, father, no, by the way, Chorley, H.F. Chorley, Henry Chorley, who was the music critic of the Athenaeum, who said the most sensible thing about Mendelssohn. I'm sorry to keep referring to Mendelssohn, but uh, it's quite important where Sullivan is concerned. Chorley went to Leipzig and listened to the orchestra under Mendelssohn's direction. And he said, Never before have I heard those minute aggravations of emphasis for which one thirsts so readily. Now, these minute aggravations of emphasis, I think, are the sorts of things that Sullivan is notating in his Songs Without Words with his hairpins and his sforzatos and his words crescendo. And I think that it was Mendelssohn's habit to be a great phraser with a P, just in case everybody thinks I'm saying he was Scottish or anything. Um, so he was, he was capable of phrasing very well. And I link this in my mind with the rather curious fact that Sullivan, follower of Mendelssohn in so many things, conducted from time to time sitting in an armchair. Um, and I've, I've wanted to try that 
I must say, because sitting in an armchair, you are prevented from minute crisis management, as it were. You, you, you cannot deal with tactics from an armchair. You can only deal with strategy. And so what I think made Sullivan such a great conductor is that from his armchair, he showed the phrase. And I think that his choral societies and his opera, his uh, orchestras were so acquainted with the style that they were dealing with that they required only to be shown the phrase. And uh, what, I, what, of course, being shown the phrase implies is that phrases speed up and slow down. We'll hear that in the song Ever, which I wasn't proposing to mention this morning, but the song Ever, which is a great favourite, not only of mine, um, Frederick Long's going to sing Ever. And it's particularly interesting because it begins with two three-bar phrases for long lines of poetry, followed by a four-bar phrase for a short line. Very bizarre, very typically interesting bit of composing going on in Sullivan's head here. And the secret of making that song work, Frederick and I found when we were rehearsing it, is to make the phrases go ta di da di da di da di ta di da 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 di ta da 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 di 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 That's the, but if we'd done it metronomically, which I suppose wasn't quite how we started out, but fairly, fairly strict. And then it's terrible, terrible. And I think that a lot of um, what I call formalist music of the 19th century, I make a distinction in my mind in the music of the 19th century between formalist music and music of gesture. And on the gesturist's side, I have Liszt. Liszt makes gestures, Berlioz makes gestures. And the formalists are Mendelssohn, Stendhal, Bennett, Sullivan. And they find, interestingly, they find their link in the figure of Brahms, to whom I've referred quite a lot this morning. They're not as much as to Mendelssohn, I know. I thought I'd be talking more about Schubert, but I've spared you that for the moment. Um, now, the, um, this phrasing... Is the, the phrasing is great. I'll get on with the tune. I was going to tell you some tune. So here we are. Now, this has got some lovely chords. It was because I was telling you about Chorley, but, I, but the Times winged chariot is sort of nagging at my mind. Chorley, you know, was described as um, a cross between a gorilla and a cockatoo. <laughs> and so anybody who could uh, invent the phrase minute aggravation of emphasis and be called a cross between a gorilla and a cockatoo has got my vote, actually. But it is said that his libretto for Kenilworth is not very good. So, sorry about that. But it turned out a wonderful song here. And the introduction has a very unusual chord. Unprepared. Great chord. I like that. And then the tune is simply this. So that was the verse, tuneful, and now here's the very catchy chorus. So that's one of the more melodic melodies that we should be having this afternoon. I love that piece. I got terribly excited when I found it in the British Library because um, it doesn't mention Kenilworth. And I thought, gosh, this is a song that nobody knows about. And alas, it is just from Kenilworth. But um, uh, the fact that it's published as a separate piano number, I think, is rather an invitation to uh, public performance as a piano song.
And my other melody that I'm going to uh, mention at the moment is um, You Sleep, which is the English translation of an Italian song um, in a stage show, which uh, is just a nice little tune. So there'll be a certain amount of um, pure melody this afternoon. And the interesting thing is that the pure melody nearly always allies itself with the stage. And Sullivan seems to know that the difference between the, the drawing room, as it were, or the concert platform, on the one hand, and the stage is that the drawing room and the concert platform were places where you did interesting intellectual things with tunes. And the stage, you just had tunes. Now, I've left myself enough time to go into some detail into Tears, Idle Tears. Uh, practically Sullivan's last song, and one of his very greatest. Um, it begins with that descending phrase, but in the piano. That's our key, and it's approached. And I don't know whether it was something that was in the air at the time, but that's how Sea Pictures began a year earlier. With that, I mean, it's nothing like Sea Pictures. I don't mean Sullivan is, is, is borrowing anything from Elgar at all. But Sea Pictures, remember, begins... That's the set. And it so happens that this begins, which is the same progression. So it's interesting to see how this particular um, well, it, it sounds very English to me. I'm, I'm trying to pick out a sort of shared Englishness in two great works by Elgar and Sullivan. And it's English to my mind because of uh, a certain soft sadness. But these are controversial waters. Now, after Sullivan has established his tonic, we have this rising phrase. And now I'm going to cut to the beginning of the second verse, which is... And Sullivan is the only composer I know, I, I know of no other example, where the second verse is a semitone lower than the first verse. Simply that. The first verse is... There's one of those soft discords that Sullivan's so fond of. And the second verse is semitone lower, but otherwise and then it goes on somewhere differently. Because of that sort of uh, tonal structure that Sullivan has invented for this most expressive lyric, uh, the corners that need to be turned are enormous. You've got to get back from D major to A flat, which is a very, very long way indeed. And Amanda and I have found in our rehearsing of this that, the, that Sullivan has carefully shown us what to do. For example, the return to the third verse, which is back at the original pitch, is introduced not by a hairpin, but by the word diminuendo. That's to say, take your time. And you need to take your time at that point. And similarly, the great climax after the agitato, when we think about these uh, lips that are for others that one has been unfortunately kissing, um, deep as love, deep as first love, and wild with all regret. And then comes the the climax, and Sullivan puts 
a tempo, meaning slow down. And we found that at, at every point, Sullivan was mercifully ahead of his performers in working out how to articulate this extremely complicated structure. Now, for this first section, which is coming to an end, uh, I'm just going to finish with uh, just a couple of remarks about my very favourite, well, not my very favourite, just one more of my very favourite, the song Sad Memories. You remember that the song with which I started, The Sailor's Grave, began and ended up with the singer going, ha, la, 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 dee, dee, dee. It's very biblical, isn't it? The stone which the builders rejected has become the, the cornerstone. The, the little introduction has become the, the great moment. And Sullivan did that before. Um, what, this is 1869, Sad Memories. And Sad Memories is um, very much a song without a tune. There isn't a tune all the way through. It's got about as much tune as Gretchen am Spinrader, which is uh, a song that I, I compare it to, actually, because the, the voice begins, you know, how, how Gretchen sings, Meine Ruhe ist hin, no, mein Herz ist schwer, and so on. And she just sort of moans, basically. While the, uh, the, the right hand is the spinning wheel and the left hand is the, the beating of the heart. And, and a great masterpiece it is. But uh, this is not so very different. Sullivan provides a wonderful accompanimental, uh, accompanimental texture. Not, not, uh, 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 how does it go? I just played it. How, how does Gretchen go? I can't remember. Anyway, well, you know how Gretchen goes. I mean, gosh, I've been playing this for nearly 50 years. That's a bit... Uh, well, you know the one I mean. Um, and um, that one. Instead of that, we have... And although a simple uh, figure, it's, it's a fruitful one. And over the top of that, the sad rememberer of the title sings the wind now is weary though dark the sky and my love is away at sea and there's some very interesting chords just about to come while the leaping waves fling their foam on high sorry high and echoing sadly each deep drawn sigh, and so on. Now, Bach, if he'd got as far as... What would he have done? What would Jerome Kern have done? What would anybody have done? But what does Sullivan do? He writes... Now, it's not so very different from that... Um, Thou to weird Mixolydian phrase that we heard in Sweet Day, So Cool. And Sullivan's doing that same thing again for sensual effect, I think. And on this goes very marvellously until it builds up to its climax. And we have only is left to me but to For those days now gone. And you think, God, that's nice. Gosh, that's sort of vaguely familiar. And you suddenly realize that the introduction was. And the climax has been. Half speed but the same tune, which is already set up for us. And then Sullivan does it again. And it's very interesting why he might do it again. And we've worked out why we think he does it again. The accompaniment, I'll play the two accompaniments and you'll see the difference. Here's the first accompaniment. I'm not going to play it like that, don't worry. Um, and here's the second one. That 
that's to say there's no detail. Instead of we get and instead of we simply have that's to say that the harmony is much more broad swept the second time. And so we take that as an invitation to sing the whole phrase the second time in one breath as opposed to two breaths. Because you will have noticed that this introduction is an example of bar form. One thing, another similar thing, a longer thing. So there's a perfectly straightforward bar form like Cherry Ripe or Rejoice Greatly. And at the end, Sullivan presents it, first of all, as a bar form. ta da dee ta dee ta dee And then a long thing. And then he presents it, very thrillingly, not as a bar form. ta da dee da da And so his formal virtuosity is able to take him from an easily grasped musical shape, which makes us feel that we know where we are in this song, to a final amazing lyrical outburst that is pure emotion. And it's this tightrope of emotion and form, which is what I find so brilliantly negotiated by Sullivan. <laughs> 